What I wanted to talk to you about today was an idea, and it is a bit of an idea, and I'm, I'm taking this community as a community where, similar to the Ascolite community, where it's very constructive, collaborative. And the idea that I've got today is something of a work in progress in my own head, so I look forward to having a discussion with you about it. The title of the talk is Personal Learning Analytics and, and Getting Off the Deficit Path, and hopefully by the end of it, we'll, you'll come to understand what I mean by that. So I suppose a place to start for this is, is what are personal analytics? And I, I sort of just made up the term personal analytics. And then it was like all good academics, you make up a term and then you go back to the literature and you see that, oh, actually, a lot of other people have talked about personal analytics. So personal informatics is, is part of it. And, and one of the things when you put personal analytics into Google, you get a lot of this kind of action, which is the Fitbit idea, which many of you would know about, uh, where you've got uh, a device that's recording your activities and then it presents to you either on your mobile device or on a web forum the kind of things that it is telling you about your activity during the day in this case to do with the kinds of calorie the number of calories you, you've burned and the, the ways in which you're getting about the world if we move it into a more academic contest is anyone on clout i'm not on clout simon's on clout so clout is another way of doing this. Uh, so it's looking at the ways in which social media and the impact that you have. So it's a personal analytics from another sort of perspective, which is looking at the ways in which your impact in the world of social media um, across the web and giving you clout scores, or there's another one down here which tells you about the number of likes you receive, the number of vote ups. This is another sort of way of thinking about what personal analytics are. My way of thinking about that, this is my first attempt at writing a piece for the conversation, which some of you will know. This is my personal analytics dashboard, uh, which is clout related. And you can see here that I was, uh, I was very excited. I was sharing this with Jason Lodge, who has something like 40,000 readers. I was very excited when I released this story on MOOCs and learning analytics, and then uh, I stopped looking at about here, I think, and then decided that I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't log into my personal analytics dashboard for my, uh, my writing on the conversation. Those are some of the ideas about personal analytics, but I want to try and draw it down a little bit, obviously, to, the, to pedagogy and education and what we do in higher education. And uh, I'm not quite sure, despite the flash talks at the, at the start, the... Um, the expertise in the room and how where people are starting from in their in their in their journey in the in the learning analytics world. So I'm going to do some sort of some benchmarking and some baselining to start. So I'm going to rip through this pretty quickly, but just to get everybody on the same page. So along came big data, and with that, very much learning analytics. I'll go through some history from my point of view that it all started a little bit before big data. But this is very much where, in the last two to three years, people have started to think about this idea of the ways in which we can use data traces the footprints of people within um, learning systems um, and, the, and the huge amounts of data that they create and do something with them. And it's very much the rage. Obviously, this group has been a leader in, in the area, but if you look at the vendors, if you look at a, a, a number of other sort of outlets, you'll see learning analytics is very much top of the pops. This wouldn't be a surprise to you. If you look at the NMMC, uh, the Horizon reports in 2012, and how it progressively has moved into the frame as something that is very close to adoption. I like, <laughs> I can understand why they had a Horizon report, which is very tech, you know, something sort of medical or, or biological. But this one, aren't these people looking remarkably concerned? <laughs> it's like, the horizon is coming. It's like, I just don't understand why they would, and maybe it's a confusion, yeah. So this whole movement comes with great promise. It's, it's something that's, that, uh, you know, with, the, with George and, and Phil's paper in 2011, really put down what the, some of the potentials of learning analytics are. And again, these would be hopefully well known to you about students at risk, ways of completing the loop to students and providing feedback. Um, also institutional aspects of this, looking at the way in which you allocate resources, the kind of things that uh, institutional decision makers are very interested in when they're in, in employing large enterprise systems and the ways in which um, analytics can help them with their decision making and resource allocation. And of course, academic research and development, which is many of us in the room would be involved in. The society put together sort of two defining characteristics, uh, sort, of, sort of two areas of analytics definition. And I, I, I like this distinction between academic analytics on the one hand, which is more at that organisational and institutional level and really targeted at the higher level of managers and administrators and funders. 
and learning analytics, which is more at the micro level, very much looking at the collection and analysis of data of learners within their context. And again, the audience members for these are slightly different. So learners, educators and teachers down at the teaching and learning level. I think that this is a useful distinction. But of course, this bit, this learning analytics bit, from my perspective anyway, somebody who's come from a psychology background, who's worked in educational technology for 15 or so, or a few more years, a few more now. <sighs> <laughs> this bit is not new. And so what I wanted to go through, and some of you may have seen this before in a presentation I gave two or three years ago at Ascolite, is that I think it's very important to remember where some of these traditions that we're all in this room today, a hundred of us are getting together to talk about learning analytics. It's very important for us to remember where some of the ideas that are the basis of the conversations that we're having over the next two days, where they come from. Here are two, and they're very much my perspective. So intelligent tutoring systems and interactivity research. Let's take the first one. Many of you would be familiar with the society, the um, Ascolite, Australasian Society for Computers in Learning and Tertiary Education. When I started out in about 1998, the year after the first Ascolite conference, the second Ascolite conference I went to, there was a paper that looked at the ways in which we can track students' data through web log files um, to look at the ways in which their learning processes and pathways are, um, are developing. And from that 1999 paper, in every conference since, there's been a paper that has looked at using data traces as a measurement tool to understand interactivity or the ways in which students are interacting in digital learning environments. This is not a new area of research or an area of inquiry or an area of practice for the Ascolite community. It's very much founded on the ideas of interactivity research. If you go back a bit further and very, very formative in my uh, research career, uh, were, were people who started to think about interactivity in a serious way in digital learning environments. One of the most influential papers for me was this paper by Thompson and Jorgensen, and they developed this continuum from reactive to proactive, where this is broadly a sort of behaviourist sort of notion. Um, this is broadly a constructivist notion of teaching and learning with students. And in the middle is this interplay between giving students direct instruction and students doing something for themselves. Another taxonomy that uh, was very influential on me is the Schwa and Mischenchuk, which is similar but different in that we've got reactive again, which is the behaviourist. This is more the constructivist. But this mutual interactivity is interesting because it is the first, one of the first, in fact, Dave Jonathan in, in 1988 had this idea as well, one of the first papers that really talked about the ways in which the system and the student mutually influence each other. The student inputs into the system, the system understands what the student is doing in some way and then provides alternative or differentiated feedback or advice to the student in some way. The student responds again, the system again interprets that. So there's this idea of adaptivity or mutuality in the system and the student system. If you have a hard look at that kind of research tradition from the interactivity research, there's some criticism of it. Often they were using fairly simple raw metrics, myself included, multiple choice questions, simple frequency counts. Everybody would be well aware of the analytics work that shows a semester of students from February through to June and looks at the peaks and troughs, which are associated with assessment and holidays. And we find that students turn up to class during semester they don't turn up to class during holidays and they cram before exams. We know this, analytics provides us a verification of this, but it doesn't, it doesn't move us much further. It's useful, but it doesn't complete the loop to, to students and or teachers. So the second tradition is the intelligent tutoring system tradition. So this is again something that, that um, I've had limited involve with, involvement with, but have, have, have investigated a little bit in the last couple of years. The basic model here is that in any area of domain knowledge, you've got a student model and a pedagogical model associated with how you think the world should be constructed for students to learn. When there's a difference between what the student does and what your expectations for the student should be, given your pedagogical model, there's some feedback that is generated to support the student. That's sort of a really um, sort of simplified, stylized version of what a the basics of an intelligent tutoring system. So here's a screen from 
that I've, I've swiped from Mike Timms, who's a, a co-researcher of mine in the Science of Learning Research Centre, which is a classic procedural intelligent tutoring system screen from chemistry. Don't too, worry too much about the detail, but the ways in which these um, systems work is that once students make a blue, make an error, or, or seem to be off track, the system does one of sort of four things. It gives them a hint, um, so this might be a help message. It flags the error for them, maybe. It gives you a broader, it possibly gives you a broader explanation of the error. Or it might show you a worked example of exactly how uh, the student should be approaching the task. And like interactivity research, there's critiques of intelligent tutoring systems. So Cumming and McDougall is one that I've certainly read which suggests that after being the top of the pops in the 60s and 70s, they really didn't have the impact that people were thinking that they were going to have. They were going to be the next best thing. But they were recognised, as Cumming McDougall says, as, as narrow and brittle. They were heavily reliant on the particular applications or programs that they were uh, in, invested in. So they were tied to a, often tied to a particular program, not generalisable beyond that program. But more to the point, they were very much determined the analytics and the way in which the analytics was used was very much determined by a lockstep sort of discrete stages and steps within a procedural simulation. You had an idea of what the procedural simulation was, you had an idea of what the parameters were of that simulation where with, if students went outside the boundaries of those, you'd provide a hint or give some feedback or show to work example. So they weren't very flexible. Taking those two traditions together, this is sort of the, the way in which my conception of analytics works. It's based on this notion that we have a student interacting with some sort of system. They, the system is a smart system that assesses, it diagnoses, and it recognises the student in some way. Once it does that, it provides some sort of sophisticated, limited, you know, um, adaptive and personal feedback to the student. And this cycle goes around and around and around, is basically what these two traditions are trying to look at. And when you think about those two traditions, or when I think about those two traditions, the ways in which those two traditions are manifest in educational practice are through really, I reckon, three um, clear, or what am I trying to say? There's three obvious ways in which they're manifest in educational practice. Drill and practice, procedural simulation, and conceptual simulation. So people know what drill and practice is. <coughs> so, uh, I mean, people might, it's very 1960s, 1970s, very much based on military-based stuff. The idea is the student enters some sort of educational system, they're presented with content, and they get clear gates within the content which are often based on multiple choice questions. Can you, do you know the right answer? Can you move on? What happens is a student makes a blue and then sort of one of three things happen. They get feedback like an intelligent tutoring system, they get more content or they get thrown back and this is pretty, problem, pretty common in drill and practice. So it's this very lockstep, crank the handle, courseware, courseware, question, courseware, courseware, question, courseware, courseware, and that's the way in which it works. With procedural simulation, similar to the ones that I've shown you before, this is a classic sort of you know, workbench in a chemistry lab. Student comes into the system, they make a blue, and what happens there is you get implicit or explicit feedback. So the implicit feedback is the fire maybe. You, know, you, get, a, you get an idea that you've set the building on fire. So that's implicit or explicit feedback very much in line with the intelligence shooting system. You shouldn't have put this in there. You shouldn't have titrated this much chemical. You should have put the pipette back in the, in the rack with the tip on, not with the tip on, that kind of thing. And then there's conceptual simulation, which is different from the lockstep procedure, do this, do that, do that, the cookbook sort of approach to science practicals. Um, conceptual simulation is trying to get at the fundamental understanding of principles associated with a complex system. This one is about kidney filtration, the six sort of key variables that enable you to understand how the kidney and the, and the nephron work. Again, if you make a blue, if you go beyond what is a, a reasonable efferent resistance pressure, 
The system again might tell you with implicit feedback, it might explode your kidney, or explicit feedback, which tells you you can't max out the variables to that extent. So that's my sort of little historical perspective on where I come from in terms of analytics. But let's get back to where we started and the ways in which analytics are used today. A lot of this came up in the flash talks at the start. Simon mentioned it in his introduction. Really, I think that analytics are fundamentally looking at three big areas today, detecting students at risk, teaching and learning, research and evaluation and quality assurance, and personalised or adaptive feedback for learning. And I don't know if you'd agree with me, but I think that this is probably the order of, of, of weight that our community is giving to this. There is a lot invested in directing and determining and detecting students at risk who are at risk. There's a lot of emphasis on that from our institutions and a lot of the effort in the initial phases of this upswing in analytics over the last two to three years has been invested in detecting students at risk. From the Ascolite slide, you can, you're aware that there's a, a good tradition of teaching and learning and that of using analytics for teaching and learning uh, research and evaluation, and that is moving into the quality assurance domain. This area of personalised or adaptive feedback for learning, I think, is, is less, um, less well researched at the moment and less, showing less emphasis. So the number one one is, is at risk, and many would know the Purdue. Can I just have a show of hands so I can know how quickly to go through this? Most people would know the Purdue signal thing. So you, most people are aware of that. Where, and there's many examples of this from the Australian context now where there are a number of variables, a number of um, uh, variables are used to predict students who are at risk. They have a nice um, dashboard. It gives you an indicator of students' performance and how likely are, they are to be at risk in their course and drop out. And there's a number of interventions that you can undertake once you have this system in place. I won't go into much detail. People know a lot about it. So I suppose my argument to this point is the way in which we're often thinking about analytics today is that we have these large enterprise systems, not just learning management systems, but other systems, library systems, admin systems. We're heavily invested in detecting students at risks. We're a little bit interested in this. We're not so interested in this. And we're heavily invested in the idea of taking data out of these systems, doing something either relatively rudimentary or quite sophisticated with them, displaying them in a dashboard really for the, mostly for that purpose. So I suppose the argument to this point is all I'm really saying is the field of educational technology, my field, my background has always been interested in using students' digital traces to assess and diagnose. When they move away from these preferred pathways, so we have an idea about what students should be doing, uh, within a system, we are heavily invested in using analytics to determine when they transgress, when they move outside the boundaries of what we think is a preferred learning parameter or a learning pathway. We assess, diagnose and recognise that deficit where they're going down, where they're transgressing, where they're moving away, and we provide some sort of feedback. Okay. And I've shown that this, these approaches um, and these movements in learning analytics have got useful pedagogical uh, applications. So I want to make this really clear. I'm not sitting here and arguing that um, looking at at-risk students and looking at the macro level at attrition is something that's not useful. But I do have some concerns with this. And my concerns with which, uh, the ways in which analytics are being applied and used in higher education are sort of twofold. The first at the macro scale, we're seeing data being applied and it's often sophisticated models like the Purdue model and other models around a sophisticated model. They're fundamentally about attrition and it's fundamentally about retaining students and keeping a bum on the seat. And there's nothing I don't think inherently wrong with that. It's about diagnosing students at risk. It's about seeing them retained within the system. But at a fundamental level, it's not really about teaching and learning. It's about maintaining them in the system. Um, so it's not really about the enterprise of teaching and learning. When you move to the micro scale, analytics which are applied for sort of personal or adaptive learning typically are applied in a context where there is a structured 
program, there are preset rules, and the adaptive pathway, when it's applied at scale, we often sort of see the worst part of this drill and practice kind of activity. What we're doing is using analytics to ask students questions, to recognise whether or not they have a deficit, and then returning them to a pathway. It's a bit courseware, courseware question, courseware, courseware question, courseware, and it starts to be a little bit of a crank the handle approach. It starts to look a bit like drill and practice. And I suppose that the, part of the irony of this for me is that what was designed, particularly in this one, to be a sort of personal adaptive learning experience starts to become anything but. It becomes quite mechanistic. It becomes quite an industrial learning experience. So I want to have a look at what we might, what, what, where we might go with that. Once, we've, once I've made that critique and we can talk about whether or not you believe in that, I want to spend the last half of the talk really talking about what the promise of real learning analytics, personal learning analytics might be. This is where some of my thinking starts to get a bit work in progress, so I'm happy to have a chat about it. I think the, one of the core promises of learning analytics, we see this a lot in educational technology generally, but any movement, when you start to really unpick it, it's sold on learning, it's when it's applied and enacted in practice, it doesn't have too much to do with learning, it has a lot to do with administration. The big, one of the biggest selling points of learning analytics is about the enterprise of teaching and learning. And this, for me, would be one of the goals that we should try and pursue. I want to show you some of the work that we've done that maybe gets us a bit closer to that. And I suppose the title of the talk, Personal Analytics Getting Off the Path, I want to start to think about how it can change the balance from personal deficit analytics to personal learning analytics. All right, here's my first example. This is a surgical seal, uh, an example of a research project we've been running for a number of years. Now, I'm going to go quite quickly through these examples because I want to get to the end. This is a surgical sk skills simulator that we've developed with uh, research team and I um, over a number of years. This is the environment here. I want to just give you a bit of background on the environment. This is the environment here. This is Yartsek. This is a haptic device. He's got 3D glasses on. This is a temporal bone. It's the bone behind your ear. And what surgeons need to do is they need to drill out the bone behind your ear in order to put a cochlear implant in to restore your hearing. It's called a mastoidectomy. This simulator is a haptically rendered 3D immersive environment to train people to do a mastoidectomy, which is the preparatory surgery task for cochlear implantation. Got it? Everyone got it? Anyone want to do it? You can do it online. What we're doing in this project, other than the, uh, the R&D process about doing a haptically rendered 3D immersive environment for surgical simulation and training, which is pretty cool, we're doing a lot of analytics work. So we've got a whole lot of metrics that come out of the simulator. We've got, we're taking about 15 records of 48 metri metrics per second. That's quite a lot of data coming out of the system. And they're in a whole range of different areas, where the tools are in 3D space, what kind of burrs you've got on, where you are in anatomical structure and things like how you're rotating the head to get good angles on what you need to do. A key stroke for us in, uh, sorry, a key metric in all of this is the idea of a stroke, which is, I'm going to put down the microphone, which is this action. It's like, um, like a dentist drill and this is a stroke. So when you're drilling, it's like drilling around with a, a little drill. That's called a stroke. And what we've done through this with, with um, a paper that we published here is we've determined um, what a stroke is and worked out ways of identifying what a stroke is. Once we have a stroke, we can get stroke duration, length, average stroke speed, and other metrics that are aggregated up from fundamental millions of strokes within the system. What we then did is we started to think about how we can use machine learning and data mining approaches to generate personal feedback to students within this simulated environment. This is not a constrained environment, it's not confined environment, it's a relatively open, complex procedural simulation. It's a procedural simulation, but students can do anything in any time, they can, they can move around. And it's not just deficit feedback, it's not, we weren't in, we were partly interested in whether or not they hit the facial nerve and meant that the, the patient's face was going to be paralysed forever, of course we're interested in that, but we don't want to restrict ourselves to just those deficit in out kind of models. We were looking for more nuanced qualitative feedback that we could provide. So 
um, not just stage-based feedback. So we wanted to provide students with feedback on things like the amount of force they used in proximity to particular structures, their length, stroke, their smoothness, their overall technique while using the simulator. What we did is we built a, a prototype which is based on hidden Markov models to just associated with one association rule, which is basically about force. And then we needed to scale that up so that we could do it across multiple measures, not just a single measure. So um, this is really James Bailey and pardon me, Yun's work, one of our PhD students, where we developed random forest models and nearest, neighbors tech, nearest neighbor techniques to develop what was really an independent feedback system that sat alongside the, the simulator. I won't go into details of this, but this is the way in which the system works um, in a sort of flow diagram. But really, this is what I wanted to get to. What we've got is a simulator with Yartsik there. We're getting huge buckets of data out of it. We're using sophisticated data mining machine learning techniques to classify behavior within the environment across multiple dimensions. We built a feedback tool, which is an independent application that sits alongside it, that sucks that data out. And then we have some decision-making rules within this about when to apply that feedback in a particular context, how to stage it, when to release it those kind of things. So it's a whole lot of decision making in here. You can't just do the analytics. You've got to make some decisions about when it's timely and appropriate to apply them in a particular environment. And then we provide auditory feedback to the student at a certain time. So things like you could afford to use more force at this stage of the procedure, or you could use longer strokes along parallel to the dura now, that kind of thing, rather than you hit the facial nerve, return to, return to zero. We tested the system in a pilot test with um, 24 students, medical students. They had a knowledge of anatomy but not of surgery. We trained them up and then we let them loose. We had a two group comparison across those variables which, was, which were effectiveness, accuracy and usability of the system. And these are the results. We were incredibly pleased with this. Pardon me. The, um, the effectiveness of the technique, so this is the percentage of students with the feedback and without the feedback who were showing expert strokes, those expert um, strokes within the, within the system. So we saw a, a nice significant difference there between students with and without feedback, which in a way is not surprising, but it's good. It's an entirely automated system. There was no human involved with this. And this is what the curve looks like. So that these are the students, this is the percentage of expert strokes. Blue is with the feedback, red was, is not. This is the degree to which you're towards the end of the procedure. And you can just see that after a little period, the feedback system starts to kick in. And with feedback, the students start to modify their behaviour so, such that it becomes more like the expert. After we did that, we videoed all the surgical procedures with those who use the feedback system. We took it to an independent surgeon and asked them to evaluate the system in terms of if you were watching that surgery as an expert surgeon and there's a trainee in front of you, would you have provided feedback at that point in time? Would have you held off the feedback? What was the feedback like? So that sets up their, their false mod positives where feedback was provided where the stroke was acceptable, false negatives or wrong feedback. And we were really surprised at these results because we tuned the system before we released it to these students with the surgeons in our team. But we found these... Is the building on fire? <laughs> Just keep talking. We found that these results particularly gratifying. So false positives where, where the system provided feedback where the surgeon would say, no, no, you don't need to provide feedback there. They seem to be going, OK, you, you, you jumped in a little bit early, um, 6.8 of the time. False negatives, um, which is the opposite, 11 point, so that where the system didn't provide feedback, but the surgeon, the expert surgeon said, I would have pulled this, the trainee up at that point. And wrong feedback, which is a little bit embarrassing, which is the system recognised that feedback should be provided, but actually gave the wrong feedback in terms of content to the student. So dual parallel to the jury, no, no, the system gave the feedback, you should now poke a hole in the ear canal. But in terms of usability, when we interviewed the participants afterwards, this was again one of the, the positive findings for us, which was the kind of qualitative comments that we got from these trainees, which was, it reminded me to be gentle near structures, was particularly helpful at particular parts of this, 
the procedure and it gave me confidence to go faster, which is <laughs> possibly not always a good thing. But these were not comments that were about, it told me off, it told me I was wrong, it told me something like that. So that's the first example. The second example is work that with my very close colleagues and friends, Barney Delgano and Sue Bennett from Charles Sturt and Wollongong. We've had a project that has lasted an obscenely long time with very little output, um, but has been a lot of fun since 1994, I think. Actually, I just got word that we published a paper today, so I shouldn't say that, Barney. <laughs> Thanks, Barney. Which is about looking at the ways in which we can look at interactivity and cognition in digital learning environments, very similar to the work that Maria's doing and Jason Lodge and, and, and colleagues in the Science of Learning Research Centre. I just want to share with you one study. The fundamental question that we were looking at in this study is how does the design of a multimedia system impact on students' learning strategies and cognition? We had two conditions in this study in two content areas. One was an observation and one was an exploration condition. And I'm going to explain that. Let me hope. I hope. Yep, I'm going to explain that on the next page. So we had 158 students at Wollongong um, complete the study. It was a crossover design where they did the exploration in one content area in global warming and then the observation in another. We did a standard pre-test, post-test design and students' activities were logged using learning analytics. So the exploration condition was very much like a problem solving, predict, observe, explain, simulation based condition. It was a conceptual simulation about global warming or blood alcohol con concentration. There were some content screens up the front which explained background to the key concepts. And then, then students had to go through this process where they'd make a prediction about what would happen if they changed a parameter. They'd change the parameter and see what happened in terms of an output and then have to explain that to themselves or their partner about what was going on. The observation condition, which is sort of like the straight multimedia page turner tutorial kind of condition, was the same, but it's just there was no manipulation available to the students. They didn't go through the predict, observe, explain. So the same content screens at the background, exactly the same. And then a series of screens that said, we've changed this condition, this is the impact. We've changed this position, this is the impact. So it's a fundamental two group design. This is the very pretty interface to this. Now the reason that this is so pretty is we did this study initially in fMRI scanners, functional MRI scanners. So we had to denude the interface from it, all sort of bells and whistles or pretty pictures to get it as flat as possible so that we didn't have any noise in the simulator which was associated with the visual cortex. Is that about right, Jason? So that's why the interface is so boring. Uh, but we, we had the tools there so we just put it out. Um, even though we weren't using a, an fMRI machine. So here are the results. We're looking forward to these wonderful results across the two conditions. And what we found was less than wonderful results. For the global warming condition, there was no difference between those guys who did the predict, observe, explain, pardon me, those guys that did the predict, observe, explain, and those that did the observation. And for the blood alcohol, well, there was a difference, but gee, it wasn't very big. And so we're a bit like, oh, that's a bit annoying. Um, and then Barney and I were looking at the data and we noticed that in the post-test scores particularly there was quite a bit of variation in the post-test scores for the exploration participants. So we looked at that a little bit more closely and started looking at the log files associated, the audit trails, the, the analytics associated with what students were doing particularly in that exploration condi condition. And it seemed that some students were more systematic in their exploration, exploration of the simulation than other students. So what we then did is thought, well, can we characterise that behaviour in the simulation condition in some way, either through cluster analysis or some sort of heuristic? And we did that. We did a cluster analysis. I'm not going to show it to you because we ended up using the heuristic in the published work. But the cluster analysis, these are the kind of things that we put into a cluster analysis of those students who are in the simulation condition to try and look at what they were, what they were doing the amount of time they spent on the material, the total time on the simulation, the number of cycles where one variable was changed from the previous cycle, the number of cycles where one variable was changed from the preset values, and the number of cycle where one was changed from the... These kind of things were entered into a cluster analysis. What we ended up doing was just writing a decision rule um, after we did a bit of exploration, where we define these categories of 
That's the tutorial group, that's the observation group, they're not included. But we categorise those who are in the exploration group as either systematic or non-systematic explorers. So students who were systematic completed four or more cycles of that predict, observe, explain, where they only changed one variable at a time. They weren't changing what we saw as students changing like seven variables, well not seven, but four variables and then hitting, seeing what the impact was, and then changing another three variables and seeing what the impact was. And what they, that, that unsystematic approach meant that they couldn't see what the impact of the input was to the output. So there's this distinction between systematic and non-systematic. I didn't explain that very well, but are people following what I'm saying? Yep, good. And then we re-ran the analysis and we were much happier with results. So these are the folks who did the tutorial, the observation, the page turner. And here are the folks who were systematic in their exploration of the simulation. And here are the folks who were not systematic. And what you can see is that the folks that did the tutorial page turner were the same as these guys. And both these groups were poorer than the folks that did it in a systematic way. So what we did through learning analytics was uncover this pattern of results that helped us to explain what we thought was theoretically was going to be a good difference between two groups. Turned out we had three groups in there. So from personal deficit analytics to personal learning analytics, am I going to be able to pull this together in eight minutes and leave time for questions? I think I can. I think I can. So what are the implications of these two studies? And I put them up as examples. There would be other ones that I'm sure you all can draw on. But from our work, each study presents a simulation-based digital learning environment, one procedural, one conceptual. That doesn't make sense, but you know what I mean. Each study employs analytic approaches which are very much framed by the learning design of the environments and the pedagogical intent of the task. This is critical and um, Laurie and Shane's work and the stuff that they've published is, makes this point as well. You need to frame the analytic approaches by what you want students to learn and what you want students to do. But the approaches that we used in the analytic approaches is tempted to move away from this deficit model of analytics based on assessing what students know, how much they fail to, to participate and how much they were at risk of disengaging with the task or dropping out of the course. It tried to move, those, both of those studies try to move away from that that deficit model, that deficit lens. And the studies show how learning analytics can be used to uncover these complex patterns of students on task behaviour, which are indicative of particular approaches to the learning task, which correspond to adaptive and maladaptive learning or thinking processes, and then are associated, particularly in this second example, with good or poor learning outcomes. It's sort of a different frame of reference in these two studies. So if you return to the question about what are personal learning analytics, this is sort of where I arrive at. And in a way, I suppose, is just the definition of learning analytics. But given what I've said, hopefully it has more piquancy to it. Analytics that are used to determine students' adaptive learning patterns and processes within digital learning tasks, which can be used as the basis for individualised personal feedback to improve their own learning processes and ultimately their learning outcomes. So I got to that point and I said to Barney who was visiting Melbourne Uni and I showed him, I said I'm going up to give this talk and, and this is what I'm going to say and I ran him through it in about seven minutes and I got to this point and he said, I don't buy it. And so that sent me into a bit of a spin because um, I respect Barney's opinion. And it, in the conversation that we had over the slides in my office, well, I started to say to him, well, maybe it's simply just a matter of perspective, but an important matter of perspective. Is it just really something about thinking about the ways in which we use analytics where the cup is half full or half empty, where the personal learning analytics takes as its lens and its viewing and its perspective as thinking how can we improve and adapt and be positive, where the deficit analytics thinks as tracking students' behaviour with a view that they're failing, that they're going to drop out, that they need to be hit with, hit with a little stick to get them back on the pathway. 
So this is where I put it out to, to you all and as in the spirit of conversation and discussion as a bit of a work in progress in terms of my thinking. It does pick up on some of the things that Shane and Laurie and Liz uh, have done in the area of, of um, process analytics and what's the term, Shane? Ta uh, benchmarking, target, checking, checking, what is it? Checkpoint analytics. They use a concept of checkpoint analytics and process analytics, which is very similar to what I'm saying is deficit analytics and um, personal analytics. So if you think about what defines what I think of as deficit analytics, you're really assessing what, um, what they're about is assessing what the individual student knows. They're determining how much the student doesn't participate and doesn't access. At the macro level, they're often multi-dimensional and using many variables. At the micro level, they're often based on simple knowledge assessments using multiple choice questions. And at the micro level, they're profiling students, simple access to learning resources and activity. It's about counting how many times they access something. And the parallel in personal learning analytics would be not just assessing what the student knows, but trying to determine where they're coming from, how they're approaching something. So not just how much you don't participate, but looking at the qualitative way in which you're participating. It doesn't speak at all to the macro, really, because it's down at the micro teaching and learning level. It's down at the task level. And it's based on students' approaches and responses to a specific learning context, which is defined by the pedagogical intent of that context, and looks at to determine the patterns of interactions within the learning activities, rather than just simply frequency counts and time on task. It's very much about patterns. So if we go back to the start of the talk, I want to be clear again about this because sometimes I get misinterpreted or confusing. Within this view of mine about personal analytics, is there a role for some sort of Fitbit for students? You know, the dashboard idea and the, the ways in which we're looking at retention and at risk. Tracking students' engagement with the university, looking at how much they're going to the library, working out where, how they're feeling on a daily basis, working out how many times they log into the LMS, are they downloading critical resources? Tracking students' engagement with the university and their courses and their curriculum at that macro level. Is there a role for that? Absolutely there is. Absolutely there is. But I don't think that we should fool ourselves that that's getting at the heart of the enterprise of teaching and learning. It's about access. It's about engaging with the institution at a particular level. It's not about how students are developing their understanding of a particular concept that we're trying to get across to them within their course of study. So this is my final slide. The holy grail, I think, and the somewhat elusive promise of learning analytics is to create these genuinely adaptive and personalised online learning environments to improve students' learning. This is what analytics is often sold on to educators rather than administrators. It's something about personalised adaptive learning that is going to improve the lot of the individual student. Identifying how students step off that defined pathway that we set for them and identifying where they transgress gets us some of the way. But I think understanding how we can use those genuine, those patterns of engagement to um, define specific patterns of engagement with specific learning tasks is really the next step that we need to cover off on in our learning analytics journey. That's me. Thank you. <laughs>